Okay. Hey, Ted. Um, thanks for being here today. I think that this is going to be a fun chat. And um, oh, like right now, usually we have like me on Discord, so everyone gets to know me. But I think that it's fair to share a little bit of Ted with the rest of the world, especially because <laughs> like Ted is one of the best person that I know. And it is wow. a crime on my part to not share Ted with the rest of the world. Um, and I think that it would be fun for people to understand a little bit more about Meta Studio, um, what they're building, and also Ted, which is the influence in a bunch of our decisions, especially in the way of creating a fair company for everyone. Um, and I think that today will be a very, very interesting and fun uh, conversation to have and give a little bit of a background about who is Ted. <laughs> The TED, yes. The TED. So, okay, so I think that we can get started. Uh, I, do you want to introduce yourself first, Ted? I mean, uh, I, I can, I guess. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ted Davis. I am currently uh, the CTO for Computer Graphics Master Academy, uh, which is an online digital art school that specializes in courses for people who want to learn art for game, films, animation, visual effects. Um, I've been in the industry for, well, I used to work in the industry for many years, but now I work primarily on the education side of things versus production. Um, but yeah, I guess a basic synopsis of, of who I am. Yep. And just to point there, also one of the co-founders of Meta Studio, which is... Oh, well, yes. <laughs> um, but... No, I think like one of those, one thing that is very interesting is that because of Ted's background, uh, it also helps a lot in terms of how we build Meta Studio in general, which are going to go dive deeper uh, as well. So growing up, who was Ted growing up? <laughs> that is a funny question to me because I ask myself that periodically, um, like if it was possible for me to go back in time and talk to that young man and, 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 and interrogate him in terms of what his outlook on life was, what he wanted to be when he grew up kind of stuff. I think it's hilarious to look at, you know, the, the, the person I was back then versus the person I am right now. But back then, I, I think I was even more optimistic about the world. I did not believe in failure, did not believe in um, that I couldn't overcome any adversity. Uh, I had a strong faith in my spiritual life at the time, so that was a huge component of, of what I used to do as, a, as an individual. Um, but primarily, I guess, in terms of how it relates to what I do now, um, I am a fine artist by training. Um, in high school, I went to, for a few years, to a what they call a magnet school, which focused on uh, fine art and performing arts. Um, so in, in, in the city I grew up, that was like one of the most prestigious schools to go to um, for, for learning art because they had a very limited number of seats. You had to compete to get in. And I was fortunate enough, but also rare in that I didn't apply as a freshman going into that particular school as the majority of individuals did. I was competing with people that were already there in terms of like, you know, they were like sophomores. So I, I got in and my 10th grade year there. And um, and, and it was a, an incredible experience because again, I grew up in a very like, uh, and some people could relate to this, but I'll just say a spiritual household where God and religion was a, a huge part of, of life, like church every single other day, it seemed like. Um, so to be exposed to a community of people my age who are doing art, but like, because it's their passion at that young of an age was eye-opening to me. So I think it was very privileged in that here, this inner city kid got accepted to this really cool program that only dealt, dealt with art and to see other people doing art and wanting to do it as a career, I didn't know it was possible for someone like me kind of thing. Um, so I was exposed to, for example, like I remember it blew my mind that you could draw a naked body in a classroom and it not be a sexual thing, right? Mm -hmm. like, and so going back home to my neighborhood or to my family and describing what I was seeing, it they just could not conceive of such a thing, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's trivial when you think about it, but 
for someone that grew up, you know, like very poor and not having access to many resources to then be in a situation where I can walk into a closet and get any art supply I wanted and, and, and just to create, it's like, it's, it's quite the experience. So that Ted uh, was just optimistic, very just like ready to conquer the world. And, you know, he was trying to navigate the different things coming his way as best he could. Um, but ultimately, I think he, he did okay. <laughs> um, I think that like one of the things that, um, that a lot of artists go through, um, e even myself, like when I was, uh, it's funny because a lot of people don't know this, but I started with my artistic career and also took course at CGMA. Um, <laughs> yes. a, lot of, a lot of artists, like when they're entering a, an artist's career, especially when they're young, which was, for example, my case, I started working as a concept artist when I was 17, which is, is not like the usual thing to do. Um, for me, it was super hard to convince my parents that that would be uh, that creativity overall would be a good career choice or a good career path. Right. Um, at the time, um, I was basically entering like medicine college, and I was like, like after the first year, like I'm I'm dropping out because I want to focus like in a more creative career than just like becoming like a doctor or like a very like corporate career overall. Um, is that something that happened to you as well? Having like the, the side of your parents being more conservative in terms of of like the stereotype of a um, starving artist pretty much? So it's a great question. And I can, I can speak in general terms and then specifically about my situation. In general terms, that in most cases was the vast, well, the vast majority of my peers and the individual to school with, that was kind of their experience because especially in, in that time to someone my age back in like the nineties, we didn't have the you know, internet as an infrastructure the way it, is, as it exists today, right? So a lot of the things that we take for granted as being just the norm or just the way things are done uh, had not yet really been conceived of or even utilized in the way they are right now. So a lot of those things had yet to still be invented or to be incorporated into actual processes in terms of just like workflow and things like that. So looking at art in, in capital letter A art mm -hmm. as a career path, it was a rare thing because at least from my generation, artists that were professional artists either went like the commercial illustrator, illustration type route mm -hmm. you know, or photography, you know, kind of thing. Very few would make it as like fine artists. Mm -hmm. To become a fine artist, you need to have access to not only resources as far as the ability to purchase and make, get supplies and like that, but more in terms of you know your connections and your network. Mm -hmm. Typically, the people that were either uh, exposed to that world by you know virtue of their parents or other you know social connections, um, or because for whatever reason the the fine art community itself you know chose them to be that next you know, uh, symbol or whatever for whatever movement or, 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 or thing in vogue at the time, um, it was very hard to break through that, uh, that ceiling. So you have many people that in essence become quote unquote starving artists because they cannot conceive of doing anything else. But unfortunately, the market for their particular, uh, you know, art may not necessarily be as strong or as diverse so in many cases, they will be creating art for the sake of creating art because that's all they know how to do, mm -hmm. but not because it was something that paid very well. Yeah. So you had those people that still did art despite you know, not having an income to support their craft or their, 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 their skills in that way. Um, but then others were able to succeed because they could do more commercial avenues, you know, illustration or photography for the bio art. So, but in my case, speak to my situation in, in more specific terms. Um, again, I was fortunate in that, again, because of the school that I was able to get into for those few years and to be exposed to what I was exposed to there, 
um, I became aware of this this thing called computer animation. You know, mm -hmm. so and again, this is like the mid early to mid nineties, basically. So um, computer animation was not that wide known of a, a field of study. It was basically in terms, of, especially in academic sector settings, it was still establishing itself as a a, a viable art uh, a, path, a path for art, whereas computer science existed, but that's more technical and more academic as far as the, the, the studies there. So you need to have strong foundations in both math and physics in most cases to actually, you know, and then computer programming on top of that. So those three things alone were out of the realm of most artists in terms of like a, a, a realistic thing to pursue. But computer animation was the first, I think, uh, like foray or branch into the uh, artistic exploration of what a computer quote unquote could do. So in high school, again, I was very fortunate in that the high school was at, had the resources to have um, computers that could run uh, computer graphic applications on them. Mm -hmm. So my first experience doing 3D was in my math class. So my math instructor also taught um, computer programming and other like things for the school. And my cl classes didn't have anything necessarily specifically geared towards that, but I remember seeing these books and these graphics. I'm like, so what is that? Whatever. And then he would explain it to me. Um, and then I think the program that they had installed at the time was, I think it was called Infinity or something like that. Um, I didn't so, know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was called Infinity. And I remember trying to consume as much as I could about that application, reading the, the instruction manual, the, the, the book on how to use the software. And I end up teaching myself how to use this tool. And he would help, of course, because he's one that, mm -hmm. you know, the computer or whatever. But it was my own, I guess, hunger to do something cool and interesting with this tool. So I remember spending hours during lunch or after school when he let me stay late in the, cl the, the class to play on the computer, as we say, and, and use this tool. And by the end of the semester, I remember being so proud of myself <laughs> of making this cone spear man move across the screen and rendered it with this like three point lighting setup. That again, these are concepts that were not necessarily, uh, well, I, well, it probably was, but I didn't know about them in terms of computer graphics, like that were just brand new. So mm -hmm. for me, that was the spark that got me interested in pursuing computer graphics as a career. Because at that moment, I realized that I don't have to compete with everyone else trying to do art, quote unquote, mm -hmm. in general sense, I can be more specific and, and do art in this particular medium. So my goal was to become a computer graphics artist in whatever way that, that manifested itself. So instead of now going to, let's say, uh, college, university, just for art, I was looking now for schools that offer programs that related to computer animation. So that was my pivot, or first of many pivots in my life, to um, pursue something I thought would not only fulfill my artistic cravings and desire, but also could make money from it. Mm -hmm. That was, I think, one of the first light bulbs I, I, I connected in terms of like art and then this new technology. I should just try to do something with the two of those things because in, in my mind, it's going to be really hard trying to fight against people and, and, and institutions or, you know, uh, 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 industry that for the most part will probably never see me or know who, who I am kind of thing. Whereas in this case, I saw an opportunity. So that's what I ended up pursuing ultimately. Like, I think that like that one thing that people will realize is that uh, TEDs in the world are like very rare. Is a very rare breed to have a pet in the world that has like a right brain super active and a left brain super active. Like it's very hard to find very creative people that are also insanely good and technical people. Do you think that your early experience with, for example, tools like Infinity helped shape um, the way that you approach art and at the same time, like 
being a creative person, but also extremely technical? Well, another great question. I love this. Um, I think it actually goes further back than that. Um, so growing up where I grew up, you know, again, poor, not many resources, your imagination was your way to escape the reality of your life in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, not to say there weren't any good days or anything like that. It's just to say, overall, you always strive, or at least from my experience, you strive to always want something better or to pursue something better in your life. Um, and again, not to harp on that, there was that whole spiritual God component thing that was very strong in my life at the time. So that played a huge factor in my optimism as well in terms of my worldview and everything. Um, but I remember as a kid, I technically was the odd, the odd child. Like <laughs> I, I grew up, uh, there's this, uh, so there's, this, there's this four of us in our household. It was well, five, sorry. My mom, my two brothers and my sister and myself. So, so it's four children, one adult, basically, single parent. We lost, I lost my father very young to gun violence, basically. Um, but my, him and my mom were married. And so we, we had a family that was potentially going to be, you know, a, a decent working class family. But tragically, one of the, in the primary breadwinner was, was taken from us, you know. So that's a whole different discussion, not going into that. But growing up, I remember, and I remember as a kid, notice like I, like, I don't, I couldn't articulate it to you back then, but I know that I was different in that when all my when my brothers and my cousins and the friends would go out and go out and play, they were you know running around and wanting to do all the fun activities. They would try to get me to go outside, but I would always, I would always want to stay indoors and watch PBS. And I grew up, that was like channel two. So I was obsessed with just things that dealt with nature and the universe, more so the universe than anything else. So when it concerned anything to do with astronomy or, or physics, I, for whatever reason, was drawn to it. Even though I could not process most of the stuff I was watching, I remember sneaking into my grandparents' room because they were the only people in my family I, 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 at the time that could afford cable television. And they had a cable television box in their bedroom on their TV. It's the only TV in the house that had, everything else had like regular basic TV. So I would go into, sneak into their room when I'm inside and start watching channels about like, you know, Wild America or like, you know, uh, stuff about the universe and planets and things like that, and just hours just watch these shows. So when I was in middle school, before I started pursuing art more, I honest to God thought I was going to become an astronomer. I because I had this this desire to learn as much as I can about the universe and about where we came from and understanding the nature of things, right? And and I remember reading this book about the life and death of stars and just being blown away about just the chemistry and all that stuff that I had no idea that any of that, like what that really meant as I do now back then. But I just remember just being, you know, drawn to it. So I think my, the, my technical inclinations came more from that curiosity and the limited ways I, I tried to explore it. And then once opportunities presented themselves where I could do more technical things, I think I just naturally, you know, fell in line. Not in line, but like uh, uh, acclimated to uh, to those situations, basically. So it, I think it it started before. I, I think I think I was primed to take advantage of the opportunity because I already explored the idea of you know becoming something more technical when I was younger. And I remember, just as an aside, and I'll shut up. <laughs> uh, I remember Bill and I, the science guy, would come on PBS. And, but before the show or episode would air, there was all the like little sponsors would be announced first. And um, I forget which sponsor this particular clip was for, but it was three children laying on their back I'm like looking up at the night sky 
And then the question that either one of them asks the group or that is being asked of them is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And one says, uh, I want to be uh, a fireman. Another one says, I want to be, I forget, it was a police officer or something else. And then the last person answers, I want to be a computational fluid dynamics engineer. And <laughs> as a kid, I hadn't, it just sounded so cool to me. So I wanted to know what the heck that job was because I mean, that's no, no knock. We need our police and firefighters. <laughs> no kid that says that. <laughs> yeah, but to hear that combination of words sounded important, sounded like something I, could, I never thought about. And I end up trying to learn about as much as I could to figure out what that was. So anyway, I'm going to start with that one, but yeah. I, the other day I was telling Tai uh, that I jealously missed Ted here in Portugal because um, I feel that you are the only person that can keep up with my weirdness in terms of philosophical and exist existential questions. Instead of <laughs> just like going back and forth in scenes that, that for other people make no sense. I remember that when we were like in, in the Uber going to Porto and just having like the questions about like Big Bang and God and just like having that entire conversation. At the end of that, I started thinking that I see that our Uber I must have thought that we are crazy just because of, of <laughs> where we are going <laughs> in terms of the conversation overall. Um, yeah. But no, it's very interesting. Um, okay, so a lighter question. Okay. And then we can go, we can go over, um, over the career because you already touched in the part of animation, which is super exciting. I want to get into that as well uh, for me right. to learn more about that. But a, a, a question that is... Um, that is interesting is what is your favorite movie? I forgot to tell you that's okay so that's a that's a tough question because it changes over time and uh, I have a weird relationship with movies only because when you work in an industry and you work on certain not certain films but on a few films over time the mystique of certain aspects of it gets worn away, right? Mm -hmm. um, but not to get off topic, um, I, I can reply with what I think are, um, this is tough, because my three, my three favorite films, um, I'm not sure how you even categorize them because they're, they're somewhat different from each other, but I think at the same time, the same. Um, as far as animation would be Spirited Away. I love that movie. Our films, I think uh, I can safely say Contact. And then- I don't think I ever watched it or heard of it actually. Okay, yeah. Um, I think it's based off of a Carl Sagan um, book of the same name. Um, and then Meet Joe Black. Uh, Another which, one that I don't know. <laughs> so oh, wow. I'm going to do my homework. <laughs> uh, well, two. I don't expect many people to even consider those in their top 100. For them. Well, maybe for the way for the animation creative people. Yes. Miyazaki. Yeah, well, but like for me, I think not growing up, because not like, I think the oldest of those three is Contact, I think. And then came Meet Joe Black and then Spirit of the Way or vice versa. I remember, so Spirit of the Way is special for me because it was the first animation that uh, I took my, uh, I, I exposed an older family member to. So one of my mm -hmm. aunts, well now I'm not gonna give her age, but at the time it was in her fifties, I think, or so, whenever Spirit of the Way came out. Um, or 60s, I forget. Anyway, she was open to, you know, being exposed to this genre of mm -hmm. like Japanese anime. You know, on television at the time, really popular was, of course, Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. And they had the, the more um, other, uh, uh, more, uh, not generic, it's not fair. They had things like 
Sailor it's more Moon. shonen and really oh well, that's so yeah. for my aunt that'll be hardcore stuff like that. But no, I'm thinking like on, like on, on broadcast television, they would have like uh, at least in our region, they would broadcast Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, and one other one I'm forgetting the name of. Um, but but in terms of like an actual like classic anime mm -hmm. you know, film. Um, she had never seen any of them. Like my first anime film I ever saw beyond watching episodes of Dragon Ball Z uh, was Ninja Scroll, which I won't go into details about that one, <laughs> but that just blew my little mind when I saw that, right? Um, so in that sense, uh, I don't want to expose her to anything that graphic or whatever. Mm -hmm. So when, when Spirit of the Way came to theaters here in the US, I made it a point to take her to go see it. And I remember just loving the fact that I got to experience the awe and wonder in her reaction to this beautiful film. Yeah. That it transcended, you know, her upbringing because she grew up in the segregated South of the United States. So she experienced, you know, being denied entry into you know, stores and being forced to use a separate bathroom and water, like all that stuff you hear about, this person is my aunt. She mm -hmm. lived, whatever. So it's not like it's that ancient history. It's like, it's still living memories for many people. So for her to go from whatever her childhood was and whatever we want to imagine it, to now sitting next to me in a theater and seeing this, this art, this, 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 this masterpiece of I, I consider, and being blown away by just everything about the film, that to me was a rewarding experience. So that that animation uh, in particular, I love because it is a, a wonderful film in its own right, but also because of the human connection that's uh, related to it as well. Right? Yeah. Um, so that so, so through the way to me is one of my favorite anim animations because of, for I, I feel that like. I feel that um, that Miyazaki's work in general, it makes it easier for people, especially adults, to get into anime because even though the animations are beautiful and and children can follow it, they also touch on points that adults can follow and get a deeper meaning behind what the anime this case oh, yeah. about and or expressing. Well, so you're you're hinting at the reason why I think I like those three films is not well, it may be for some obvious, but beneath the surface is because they all deal with existential element about mm -hmm. our existence and reality. Miyazaki's case is about death and the transitions between the, the two worlds, whatever. Um, contact is about um, the origins of life and our place in the universe itself. And then Meet Joe Black, without spoiling it, um, deals with death as well, but in the inverse, in terms of like what happens if death came to us and mm -hmm. is trying to figure us out and how does it interpret our existence and stuff. So I think those three films speak more to my nature and character about, and I even mentioned that in, in first the Uber Ride, where I mm -hmm. like I float around in that existential space, whatever, thinking about those, those things. Um, so, in a manner of speaking, yeah, I think uh, my answer to that question would be those three films as of now. They may okay. change or whatever. Okay, and favorite game? I might know the answer for that one. <laughs> right now or in general? In general. Oh, God. Of course you would say that. Um, I would say uh, because of my age, uh, well, no, I have I have many favorite games. It's just some I can replay again over and over again, and mm -hmm. others are just because of a particular experience in time or an achievement, for example. Like the game I was most proud of beating, I believe, was the first Tomb Raider because I had never played a game like that in my life. It was on the, I played on the Sega Saturn. Um, and I remember like 3D graphics existed. You had Virtual Fighter, I think, was one of the mm -hmm. games at the time, or right before that. And you had um, 
the kind of thing I know through you guys, but this one in particular was what I would actually call immersive. Look at the graphics now, it's laughable compared to what we have today. But again, answer, answer, this kid that grew up, you know, not exposed to many things to see that game, I remember saying it like at a Sears or some store and they had like a, 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 cons a console that it had on the television connected in, in the aisle there and playing it and like, I need to get this game. So I don't know how in the universe we were able to get a Sega Saturn, but somehow, some way, we got that and got Tomb Raider. And I remember spending hours. This was no internet. I couldn't go look up tips and tricks or you know help guys. I couldn't afford to go buy. Uh, I forget what the, the the physical magazine they would sell. It was not Power PC. It was some some magazine that was have tips and tricks and stuff. And I remember going into the stores to read through it, because I, but I couldn't buy it because I couldn't afford it or whatever. So playing this game, I had to beat it on my own. And I remember being so proud that all those puzzles and little things I figured out without having to get any help. So, so that, that pride of accomplishment, I remember that game sending out for me for that reason. Similarly, uh, another game called Panzer Dragoon, that I had the same experience with as well. Um, so they were favorites for that reason. In terms of play replayability, of course, most of the Mario games I used to love. It, even, even now, I, I could go back and play them again. Um, Mega Man was a huge one when I was younger, playing that mm -hmm. repeatedly. Um, Metroid, oh, when I beat that game, oh my God, you couldn't tell me anything. Like, I was a god, because that game, literally took me years to be because it was just so weird and so different. I mean, it's, it's a simple mechanic, but you know, the way it was laid out and done, I think it was really, really, really fun and, and challenging at the same time. Um, beyond though, I mean, I can name a lot more games from that era, like Battletoads was insanely difficult. Never beat that, but I used to love to play it. Um, and then Sonic the Hedgehog, I used to love as well. So I guess that, that genre was really fun to me. Transitioning more into like high school and early college, I got into, um, well, no, more college actually. Uh, I was exposed to uh, StarCraft and first person shooters. So, yeah. well, actually it's not true. First person shooters I got exposed to in middle school and that was playing, I think the original uh, Doom, uh, mm -hmm. game. Um, at the time on a Mac, I was thinking. Um, this is the version I played. Um, and then, uh, oh no, it wasn't Doom. I'm sorry. Was it Castle? Maybe Castle? Quake? No, it was, I can look it up. It was, I'll look it up later. I forget. Mm -hmm. It was one of those games that it was like on a, a Mac. Because Mac didn't have many games at all, but I remember playing it on Mac. Um, that in Battle Chess. So. Um, but anyway, I got into, and, and, and yeah, as in, in college is when I got exposed to like, I, what I call like more real games, like, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, Quake, Doom, um, I remember Serious Sam being really big, mm -hmm. uh, and I loved that game, and I remember we would get into battle royales in our lab, so <laughs> just to get people an understanding of where I went to a school or, or university, or college, I should say, um, this college doesn't exist anymore. It was purchased by the Art Institute. Um, it's now called, I think, Miami International University of Art and Design or something like that. But back then, it was called the International Fine Arts College. So their facilities uh, occupy this historic, beautiful building from like the turn of the previous century, you know, before that, um, the Miami Women's Club, I think, whatever it was called. It was, so we had, Primary courses were mostly in there. But then all the, like, for me, my classes were inside of the, so right next door to this historic women's club building that they had the main college campus on uh, was the uh, Double Tree Grand Hotel. <laughs> and it was like a resort hotel. So think of, um, think of Miami, Miami's still Miami. So this hotel has like, beautiful like yachts and massive boats like right out back 
you know, that you can walk around the area. And then our computer labs were on the, the first floor and second floor of their like, like mall shopping area. So think of like walking to the resort hotel, beautiful people everywhere, luxury stores and stuff like that. And then there's your computer lab, like mm -hmm. with glass windows facing out to look at all this wonderful, these wonderful things walking by. Whatever. So, so we had classes in this, this space, which was like, if you, when I think about it in hindsight, was incredibly bizarre, you know. Uh, but that that was the, the 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 reality of that world. But anyway, it was on that first floor. It was four different computer labs, um, and at the initially, the uh, we had uh, I think it was all SGI computers. And for those of you who are old enough, you know SGI. Um, they basically were running, I think, O2 machines there at the time, whatever. Um, and then eventually PCs became the new thing. Mm -hmm. So I mean, they, they switched out um, the, the server to a, a, a PC-based uh, server. And then they opened the first PC lab and how much faster the PCs were than they, the O2 machines. Um, so the whole internal fight about that within the, the, the lab culture. But the point I want to get to is that we would have these LAN parties between the labs playing these first-person shooters that went on until the early morning hours. <laughs> because the people that were in charge of running the labs, in most cases, were students because they had a work-study program. So people watching the lab, cleaning the lab, or people that were earning money that went through the tuition to run it. But these are you know, my, my fellow mm -hmm. classmates. So we would lock the door to the main like entryway for the labs were at, so no one would come in and out after hours. And then anyone was inside, got to play whatever they wanted to do. So we would do like these massive kill fests. Like we would just go in and just like get in teams and just some of the most fun you can ever imagine is like these powerful machines are not being used to play these, <laughs> not these first person shooter games. But it was like amazing. And I remember a couple competitive people that were like, uh, especially in Quake, that were like, who did actual com competitions, will be in there and it's just, just murking everyone. Just like, like, it just, like they float by just killing everything as they go by. So you always avoid them at all costs. <laughs> but aside from that, it was still so much fun. And then I remember when, when StarCraft came around, and the labs would still be competitive, but because it was limited in terms of the number of players that could play at a time, uh, people would get more focused and quiet. And then you would only have to talk to your team mate and try not to let the other people know what you're doing, you know? And I remember those games being really intense and really fun as well. So, so for me, uh, StarCraft, especially the first one in the Root War campaign, those were amazing games to play. Uh, and then a lot of the first person shooters, I think the one that ended up by the time I left that became the most popular was Serious Sam. Um, and then there's that. Fast forward to today, which is one I think you're thinking about. <laughs> My current favorite game right now is No Man's Sky. Um, I put like, so there's, let's just say, I don't want to say thousands. I'll just say hundreds of hours of game <laughs> in that game. Although it's, I know it's more than that. It's just that on my official, like if you read the number of hours officially, it only says a few, like a, not a few, it's, it's several hundred hours. But in reality, because I play in like um, more of like the, I like to do, do like my own custom building and stuff. I, those don't register because I always overwrite the file. Mm -hmm. I'm that. So the time I spend doing things will sometimes be overwritten because I'm just experimenting and playing around. So I love that kind of like space for them. Um, and then beyond that, uh, I would say uh, Diablo, well, right now it's Diablo 3. It's, I'm waiting for 4 to come on online, but I'm a, a huge Diablo 3 player as well. So I know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can watch it. I've been rambling for a while, but yeah. Those are the, um, that's my game. Uh, at least it's, and it's a sample of my history. In, in my first game, 
that I ever played is actually in your list. Like the first game that I ever played in my life, I remember like I was around like seven or eight and it was Tomb Raider, the first one on PS1. Um, I played the game and it's extremely hard. And I remember at the time, like you have like little tiger that will basically go after you. But I obviously always play like the first level and past the first level. Um, but and, but like my brother, because he was older, he basically finished the game and I was watching like playing the game. And then as he finished, I always came late what he was doing and then also like finished the game. Recently, um, I got a Steam Deck and I downloaded the emulator for PS1 and I started playing like the Tomb Raider again, the first one. And I find so interesting that now working in the industry and looking at what they did like in 1996, that I believe is when the game came out. Um, the ga- it's like so interesting in terms of technology because the game at the time, um, you would have to, like you couldn't move like sideways. So you'd have like to adjust uh, Lara Croft in yeah. a corner, do a backflip so that you can jump forward to climb on scenes just because of the mechanics and how the game works. I was like, that is so, so interesting. But it's one of those things that people don't think about it on how those teams basically overcame challenges that now we take for granted uh, with the technology that we have at our disposal. Right. Yeah, I think that speaks more also to just a general commentary on um, like life overall, like as things become more efficient or more accessible, do we lose, uh, for example, the ability to problem solve? Mm -hmm. Like, so there is something to say when you have limited resources or limited tools, what you're able to do versus giving access to a sandbox full of everything you could ever want. In both cases, you could argue anything is possible, but not really. Like, I think it sometimes becomes limiting when you have access to everything because yeah. the number of choices, the number of approaches or methods you could use, you know, it becomes a battle of making sure you make the right decision versus making the best decision, I guess, like for your situation. And I think when you have limited tools or resources, it forces you to be creative in terms of how you utilize those those tools. You know, in the case of the Tomb Raider example you gave, they had to employ mechanics that were not necessarily intuitive at first mm-hmm. glance. Um, but because they had a particular vision in mind, or it could have been an accident for all we knew, the, the, the end result was something that was both unique and enjoyable for the end user. And I think yeah. that's something that you said for that. You know? So and I think I've always, yeah, go ahead. No, I think that like that their limitations as well uh, ended up allowing them to design the puzzles in a different way. That right now it would be counterintuitive for it to build puzzles that way. Uh, but because of the limitation that they had, it actually worked in their advantage in creating a very engaging game. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, I remember one game I used to love that I thought they were so creative in terms of their approach. Uh, it was, I'm not sure what you even call that genre. It's like a, I think it was the sequel to Miss. I think it was called Ribbon, if I'm not mistaken. Are you familiar with Ribbon? Okay, so you all can attack me in the comments, whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I forget the name of the genre. Basically, they did either, uh, it was a combination of photorealistic renderings and photography to create this virtual world. Mm -hmm. And the way you navigated the world is basically by, you know, it's basic navigation. Like, you know, you will walk from one, um, like uh, one point of interest to the next by just moving your cursor from where you are right now to where you want to like to the next location. And it would just take steps and like, you know, it was like pre-rendered, mm-hmm. you know, but it was very beautiful stuff. But the puzzles and the the story 
which I won't give away, even though it's been decades since it came out. Um, I remember that, like, I remember like applauding them because, again, for them to have a world that looked that beautiful and to have the puzzles work where they did and the way everything was tied together, the different islands and the story, like, it, again, you are limited only by your imagination, is at the end of the day mm -hmm. what I want to to do, probably to like, and to see what that team was able to, to put together is like that was very inspiring because again, it reminded me of um, experiences I had when studying computer animation uh, in school, um, where what do you call it? Um, like, I remember that everybody wanted to be a model. Mm -hmm. when I was like everybody because modeling was the cool thing like because you get to make your character or the environment or both and all the other disciplines were kind of neglected right it was either that or animation I'm sorry it was either being a modeler or an animator everyone wanted to do that so I remember my first year in, in college and, and at the end of that year I realized that again like I did before fine artist versus being a computer animator. With infinite animation, I realized that there was people, these popular things that people all went towards. So I'm like, okay, I don't want to compete with people at that level. I want to do something different or something unique, like all artists want to do. So I started looking at other parts of the computer animation process that appealed to me that was still fun to do that wasn't animation or modeling. And that's when I stumbled across texture, mm -hmm. texturing, basically. Um, so in college, uh, we learned on um, Alias Wavefront's Maya version 1.5, I think is the version I started out with, um, on SGI 02 machine. So it's a Unix operating system, um, which is I guess a precursor to what the Mac OS is based off of Iris. I'm not getting to this kind of. So it's command line to launch Maya to do certain things, whatever. But by and large, Maya claim to fame is that they had the GUI. They had that user interface with the hot box, which was mm -hmm. revolutionary um, at the time to do things. Or does that come a little bit later? I forget. It. Anyway, Maya. Uh, had uh, a book that you went through that taught you how to use the application through these like tutorials of sorts mm -hmm. that built on the previous tutorials skill set to accomplish the next one's kind of thing. Um, and one of the big things in that book that they did not go into great detail explaining, but that you kind of did, but it's because it was given to you, not because like they didn't teach you how to think, it just gave it to you and you just did it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so when it came to the texturing portion of the course, you know, everything by and large was very procedural in nature. So when it came to applying, I'm, I'm thinking general terms, but I could get mm -hmm. more technical. Um, applying color to an object, you know, you, Basically, we're using the the uh, like the standard tools or standard you know techniques to do that, and in most cases, it was a procedural method that you did. So that's using the computers or the the soft the applications um, native like um, texturing tools or shaders to create that look for an object, and that was it. People didn't. I remember. For example, working on Saucy to Seal, which is, you all can Google that if you want. And I remember like not being satisfied with how it looked. I wanted my seal to look real, you know? So I tried to find ways to make that look as cool as I possibly could. And the limited research I could do at the time in terms of that, you know, was extreme. So it was either like, another tutorial that kind of did the same thing or mm -hmm. just I am just showing you their magic and not telling you a single thing of how they did it, whatever. So you were stuck in a way. Um, but being curious, 
in vain persistent, uh, Manny and I got teamed up during the beginning of our second semester for a group project. And me and him being very ambitious, also competitive, but very ambitious, wanted to like make the best project in the in our great or in our group or our class or whatever. So we bit off more than we could chew. We made this elaborate story about an invasion of some kind, aliens coming from space, blah, blah, blah. Like, why? So Manny ended up modeling this and animating this like gnarly alien creature, basically. I was doing the environment, particle effects, and the rocket stuff. But during that exercise, we went, and I was proud of us for doing this, and, and I remember making the quote unquote discovery that you can actually take a photograph or a picture of art and bring it into Maya and you could project it onto that object or you could apply it as a texture to a surface. And when I discovered that and I showed Manny that, Manny understood the magnitude, like, Oh my God, we were just taking images and textures of anything that we could get our hands on, bring them to mind and just throwing it on to see what it looked like. And if it looked cool, we kept it kind of thing. And it's just that kind of like exploration ended up having us create some of the most beautiful renders ever in terms of people within our group had ever achieved. And it was so good, in fact, that the people that were, you know, a year or two more advanced than us, who were like now, you know, juniors or seniors or whatever, mm -hmm. I forget the term of college, whatever it's called, um, were looking at us saying that we didn't do that word or we were cheating something, like making up the most bizarre, silly arguments. They couldn't believe that we did that or that you are, are allowed to do that. They were creating mm -hmm. restrictions on themselves as to, no, you're supposed to use the, the method in the book, or whatever, but it's like, we care more about how the final result was. So I remember that being a really valuable and important lesson in that um, you can't just restrict yourself to what you're told. What you're told is meant to be like a, 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 like a, a guide like a boundary in terms of, so, you, so it's basically so you can understand the rules of the system. Mm -hmm. But once you understand the rules and why they exist, then you're free to go beyond them because you know why they exist. And then if you break them, it's for a particular purpose or reason. And in that you're not restricted by them in that sense, especially in a creative space. Like why are you limiting yourself to what the tool quote unquote, is supposed to do it. And when they, it clearly can do way more than that. So when we got through with that project, we never finished it, by the way. We ended up submitting like, I forgot, like maybe a minute of animation or something. So um, like more time taking pictures and trying to figure you see yeah, the project. Yeah. But what we learned from that, you know, helped, I think, shape the course of our education going forward, mm -hmm. you know. Because we realized that number one, our instructors, God bless them, were just a couple more years ahead of us who have been graduated and got degrees and everything that are now teaching us. But in terms of actual practical industry experience, they didn't have it, right? Mm -hmm. So we didn't have guidance in terms of those processes that the studios were using because our instructors didn't have the skill set to teach that because they didn't go you know, work on those films and everything. Another thing is that you have to be hungry to improve yourself in terms of research and experimentation. Like read as much you can, as you can or learn as much as you can about a given area of interest that you really, you really care about and experiment within that space. And don't be afraid to, you know, break things or mess up. Like, and not to ramble too much, but like that also echoes to an earlier lesson and that same high school I talked about, I went to uh, earlier uh, for art, that I remember one of our instructors um, got really upset with the class one semester in high school when, because part of our assignments, or like, so they had different grading structures, but one of the criteria was that you had to maintain an active sketchbook. 
at all times. At the end of a term, they would take your sketchbooks and go through them to grade them. Now, initially, when you go through that process, they don't tell you what they're looking for, what they're grading mm -hmm. you on, you know. But when you go through that process the first time, and I remember it clearly in terms of like handing in my sketchbook, amongst each other, we used our sketchbook as like a, a way to show off how good we are or what we're working on kind of thing. So when you look at people's sketchbooks, in many cases, the majority of people never really filled it up because mm -hmm. spent so much time trying to make good art or beautiful art or something to impress their friends or you know to make other people look bad or whatever. That's a thinking as mm -hmm. young people I'm being silly. Um, but the, the point our instructor was trying to get us to understand why and why he got upset with the majority of the class. Very a few students got the assignment. They understood what the purpose of sketchbook was. But what he had, he had to articulate to us was that this book is not meant for you to create masterpieces. Mm -hmm. It's like this is meant to be an extension of your own internal mind experimentation and imagination is meant to be a play a, like a place a safe place for you to explore ideas good and bad beautiful and ugly ultimately it doesn't it's not even about whether it's beautiful or not it's more about you figuring out how to think right mm -hmm. and when he was looking at the i mean people had some killer artwork but he would just give them like a, a not a failing grade, like a, a D or whatever the low grade was, because it's like that's not the point of the sketchbook. The sketchbook was meant for you, for us to see your progression over time and how you problem solve and approach mm -hmm. different problems and assignments over the, the, the that school year. So they were hoping to see when they gave us an assignment, we go to our sketchbook to flesh it out, to think about ideas, to figure out proportions or whatever, or for doing figure drawings to, you know, do gesture drawings and stuff like that. So it was meant to be literally that space that they can see that, okay, from beginning to end, you went through and we can see your progress. We can see how you think. We can see how you're approaching this and that. But in most cases, people just have pretty art, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so that was a, an important lesson I learned very long, that to, to, to not be afraid, especially when you're learning, to ask questions to try to figure things out and, and and it's okay to mess up because when you're messing up as cliche as it sounds those are what the lessons typically are is this that because then you learn from that approach or what you may perceive as a mistake is actually you know going to be the thing that propels you forward kind of thing so um so long story short i end up discover discovering i say texturing as my route to uh, a professional career at college because I saw it as something that not many people were doing at the time. Mm -hmm. Everyone's trying to be an animator or a model. And to me, God bless you. I can do that too. That's not <laughs> discount Ted. I was a really good modeler back in the day. Uh, but I saw that it wasn't, I, I should be focusing on something else that I'm also really good at, that I absolutely, I, I do like. And, and pursue that so. for like I, I have like a question that it can, it can take like in the route of a very philosoph philosophical question that is do you think that like most people that whenever they fail at something they end up taking the actual valuable lesson from when they fail or do you think that people need to fail like more times at the same thing until they learn what that lesson actually is Great question. So that, that depends on both the individual, but more importantly, their worldview, I think, um, not to get philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, the, I think this is, this is controversial. This, this is my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, or I should say, I think different aspects of our human experiences can compensate for areas. Like, so you can be strong in 
many ways and weak in other ways. And I think overall, they, they should, in most cases, balance each other out and make you a whole decent human being, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so where, from in my experience, it's because of the adversity, it's because of the difficulties, it's because of the limited resources, because of all these becauses <laughs> that I had to figure a way out or a solution mm -hmm. to that I think allowed me to approach the world in a different way than maybe the person next to me who may have grown up in an environment where everything that they needed was accounted for and taken care of, where they didn't have to worry about shelter or food, things mm -hmm. like that. So again, for most people, it's not an issue, but for those that it is an issue, you, your mind thinks, I think it's not wired differently, but it becomes accustomed to approaching the world differently. So when you apply, I think, that experience to an academic setting, especially when it concerns problem solving, I think the approaches can be different in terms of just like, you know, how you learn. So for me, I, when I go through a negative experience, you better believe that I'm gonna remember how I felt. Mm -hmm. I may not remember the actual action or the thing that was done or that happened in great detail, but that feeling that I experienced, that I do remember. And in most cases, I don't want to have that feeling again. Mm -hmm. So whatever it was that caused that thing to happen where it did, I try to avoid it, right? Um, and to sort of kind of solve for it, right? Um, so in that sense, um, you can project that down to just the classroom experience, like, and in learning, um, if I make a mistake, and I, I understand that it is a mistake in the first place, then I think I'm better able to learn from it. Whereas if I'm ignorant of the fact that I did something wrong, then I may repeat it a couple more times unbeknownst to myself and end up, you know, affecting the outcome of the situation or in the, if it's a relationship hurting a person potentially, you know, if it's production, you know, not delivering something on time because of that behavior or, whatever, or that particular, you know, time consuming approach. So it's, it's I think it's, it's, it's a combination of, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, well, ultimately it's, I think how a person approaches the world and what experiences they, they've had so far, I think determine. Yeah. Uh, they sense. learn from a single encounter that lesson, or if it takes multiple tries for them to, to figure it out. Um, some people, you can just tell them something and they get it. Mm -hmm. God bless them. That's not me all the time. Um, others, they require the friction of life in order for them to be <laughs> dragged into where they need to be. You know, they need to go through some stuff sometimes. To, to, um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so like we, we touched a little bit about um, texturing and surfacing for people that have like zero knowledge about the industry, how texturing <laughs> works, like what it is and what is like, why it's so important uh, in games, movies and animation. Um, if you will explain to someone like they're like five year old, like what is the role of a texture and surface artist? Uh, how do you explain that role and why it's important? Okay, uh, so that's a, a fun question uh, because uh, I have so many ways to be answered. Uh, but the approach I will take is that I make a distinction between a texture artist and a surfacer. Surfacer is a term that I was introduced to at DreamWorks when I was working with them. Um, but it's more, uh, actually you gotta add a third thing in there. So there's something called a look development mm -hmm. artist. Um, that's more of a vis visual effects uh, term or, mm -hmm. or position or role than it is, you know, um, like a universal one. Uh, but to, to get back to the, the answer. So a texture artist is someone concerned with 
applying uh, color or texture to the surface of objects in a virtual or computer generated environment. So if you think about 3D objects as being uh, analogous to a real life object, the, um, the thing about a, a virtual object is that it needs to be told what it is. It doesn't know what it is. It doesn't have a, an underlying description of being the thing it's, it's trying to mimic as far as real life. So you have people that specialize in creating the form in 3D, three-dimensional space. Those are typically called modelers. They sculpt using, you know, these tools that manipulate um, these, uh, these, not to get too complex for five-year-old. So you have computer programs that describe how um, objects should be created and how they should work or function. And these objects lack certain features that, you know, will inform you of them being that thing. So if a modeler is someone that sculpts in the computer or using, or using a computer application, then that model may lack color or texture mm -hmm. to help further uh, mimic or approximate the, 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 the appearance of the real life thing it's trying to, to, to emulate. So for example, a modeler may make a, 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 a wooden table so this wooden table will probably have four legs. It will have a, a surface on, on, on top. Uh, maybe it has screws that the screws keep the legs attached to the, the top of the table and so on and so forth. But when you look at it, it doesn't have that wood quality. Mm -hmm. So a texture artist will either use their tools to by hand create and paint what looks like wood using traditional artistic methods and techniques for building up color, value, saturation, things like that. And then apply that on top of the surface, like gift wrapping paper wraps an object. The surface has different descriptions that help tell it, you know, where this image should, you know, be positioned on the surface. Now the texture artist is not necessarily responsible depending on what, okay, so, so in games, yes. V visual effects, not necessarily, but to make it distinct, they don't, they're, they're not concerned with the, the process of like unfolding a surface to make it so that when you apply a texture or some kind of color to it, that it looks, accurate. You have mm -hmm. modelers that do something called the UV layout, or there's now really sophisticated algorithms or, 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 or techniques that do it automatically for you. Um, but back in my day, it had to be done by hand in most cases. So especially depending on the object you're using, whether it was a polygonal object versus a NURBS object, which is a sub either object versus, you know, something that uses um, uh, voxels or whatever. So Ignoring those complexities, literally a texture artist is, creates the physical uh, like color image or map that gets applied to the surface. That's their role. A surfacer is a texture artist that also does look development. Mm -hmm. So look development is concerned with both the lighting of an object and the material shader that the object is assigned. So a surfacer doesn't necessarily light the object because the lighting artists do the lighting. You know, we get a rig that, you know, approximates the basic volume that that object will appear in, in terms of like that shop or sequence. So we get that lighting rig and within that rig, we can import that model to this, basically see how the light's gonna behave with that, that surface, right? Then we create the shaders, which are also these little mathematical descriptions of how light should behave when hitting that object or that surface. So shaders, you know, is like the human interface in terms of like between the physics of light transporting 
and reflecting and refracting and bouncing all that fun stuff. And then the maps, the, the, the creative artistic part. So a surfacer is responsible for doing both of those. So they, they create the actual images, textures, colors, as far as like 2D images and things like that. But now we have two, so we actually now paint in 3D. Mm -hmm. Just like anyway, of my lifetime, it's it's, it's a vast. So then, paint there is amazing. <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, so you could just paint directly now on the models, whereas before you had to use maps to apply that. Uh, but the, the 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 material shader that the, that mathematical description of how light should behave when it hits the surface, that in most cases is pretty uniform as far as in terms of how it looks. So it needs these textures or these images or these maps to break it up in terms of mm -hmm. like its reflectivity, its, um, its color, um, or some other attribute in terms of like bump maps or displacement maps or normal maps that could perturb the surface as well. So there's different aspects of a, a surface that may require different approaches or applications to make it better mimic the real life thing. A surfacer is concerned with both the maps that come into a shader as well as the manipulation of that shader to better match the real life thing. So texture artists are always only concerned with just the images, just the mm -hmm. color and creating those assets to be given to other artists to then apply to the object. The surface work goes a step further and is also concerned with the shaders themselves, the things that you know the the maps are applied through onto the surface, and then you know how they affect the light that bounces off of them. Basically, that's the simplest way I can say or summarize. <laughs> Um, as a surfacer, a texture artist and surfacer is concerned with recreating the material appearance of objects in a virtual environment. I guess that's the best way. Um, I'm going to put like my hat of someone that doesn't understand anything in the industry. And <laughs> earlier on, you described that um, that you and many were basically playing with photos and creating textures through photos. But then, for example, if the the surface is something that requires, for example, fur. If you just add a photo to it, it will feel very rigid and unreal. So how is that uh, physics is applied at that process, um, making it feel that it belongs to that world? Wonderful question. I'm not 100% qualified to answer it, but I'll give my, my understanding of it. So, uh, so when it concerns those aspects of a surface that are not easily replicated by just a 2D representation, you have to break it to the third dimension. So that requires some additional element uh, to exist in order for it to better mimic that real life, you know, artifact or, or, or component. In the case of hair and fur, um, that in most cases is some kind of either curve-based or particle-based system that itself is an approximation of what a real life, you know, uh, you know, hair for. Mm -hmm. So in most cases, you know, you are, I'm gonna say use the word physically, not in a literal physical world, but mm -hmm. you're physically growing hairs or fur, uh, on that particular object. Now, in terms of interactive 3D manipulation, you're using, you know, very crude approximations of, of hair fur. Because it was most, well, I'm not sure about today, but in my day again, you couldn't really display that much complexity mm -hmm. on screen in real time because there was no, it was physically impossible to do with the technology at the time. So you had to rely on the software rendering engine to be able to translate, again, these descriptions, because at the end of the day, they all come down to mathematical descriptions of what this surface or this particular oven is supposed to be. So when you saw a single curve growing out of the surface of an object, it could represent a pack of, let's say, 100 pairs. Mm -hmm. 
So you so that that curve is more a representation that you use to find not only the location of where the hair is supposed to be growing or the fur is supposed to be growing, but also its orientation in space, meaning the direction it's going to be flowing. So the idea in that case, when I worked with fur or hair, is more about grooming it, as they say, in terms of like making sure that you manipulate that 3D element in such a way that it went the way you want it to go. Then it was up to the shader, and the shaders for hair and fur are slightly different in terms of how they're applied and work than a material shader. They may rely on other techniques or volumetric type of approaches where when they, when they at the time of render, it will substitute that curve or that, that, that representation with some internal model that mm -hmm. either the software program that you're working with uses or that the studio you're working at has a proprietary technique or approach they came up with that they think is better. So depending on, again, those variables at the time of rendering, you know, the software translates both the artistic input in terms of the grooming aspect of how that hair was shaped and the direction went to flow and, and things like that. And then the mathematical description in terms of like this particular element needs to be this length, this width. I'm gonna reference this number to determine how thick I will be at the base versus how narrow at the tip, you know, how the color, you know, flows across that entire, you know, form. So those things can be controlled by, you know, numerical values or actual maps to help, you know, break up that perfect, you know, look and stuff. So in that sense, for like hair and fur, when you're talking about like realistic looking stuff, it, you have to incorporate the 3D aspect of an actual, you know, element there. It's not just a painted image or, or, or trick to, to do, basically. And sometimes that also involves Python or VEX if you're using Houdini, which is not fun things to, to do when you're doing art. Like trying to trying to come up with simulations uh, for artists is that the fun part? Just making sure that things look, look good as well. Um, yeah. So earlier on, we also touched like in your experience at DreamWorks. Uh, can you give us like a breakdown of Ted's amazing career in the entertainment industry until DreamWorks? I mean, what I can remember. Um... <laughs> Uh, so, uh, very early on, I actually was an entrepreneur for many years, um, both back then and today, or recently today. Um, so, uh, straight out of college, uh, my few of my friends, we decided to start our own animation company. So, for a few years, both in college or right after college, excuse me, we focused on you know, being professional artists. We literally had a studio in South Florida uh, where we did computer animation and we actually had clients, our first real clients and stuff and got paid to do that for like three years. So um, so that was my first taste in terms of professional capacity. Um, in terms of like the industry itself, that didn't happen until around 2005 for me, um, as far as not being an entrepreneur in the industry, but working for a studio or working for a larger company. That happened in 2005. Um, I started out in gaming first. So um, the company I worked for did a lot of, um, they were more of a third party vendor for larger studios that would outsource their work to us to help them finish by a certain deadline or to you know, fill in the, the staffing resources they lack. You know? um, but we specialize more in like pre-rendered cinematics for most cases mm -hmm. um, or animation work. So uh, I got to work on many games that a couple I was credited for, but many I, we never got credited. Only the studio itself probably got a credit on the actual game, but not individual artists themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, we were a third party shop in that sense. Um, but they ranged from God of War, Gears of War, Spire the Dragon. Um, uh, oh God, the, there's this one, um, not Guitar Hero, it's this other type of like, like music-based game, I remember. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a few games. Uh, I, I was, uh, 
the horror game, Silent Hill. Silent Hill. Um, what else? Um, there's a few. I'm just trying to remember them all. Um, so I did that for the first few years in the industry. It was gaming. I'm working at another studio, working on very briefly uh, for. Um, it was, like a, it was, I want to say Rise of the Argonauts or something like that. I'm, they're going to kill me. They would be but that, and then um, I remember going to SIGGRAPH one year and giving my demo reel to a recruiter at Digital Domain at SIGGRAPH um, and ended up getting called back. And long story short, I ended up uh, leaving the game industry altogether <laughs> to work for visual effects. Um, at Digital Domain, I started out in the commercial division, working on commercials before being transitioned into feature film. And I did a domain on a few projects there. Um, the one I was most proud of because that's why I wanted to get into visual effects in the first place. After seeing the movie Transformers, I'm like, mm -hmm. I want to do that. I want to make that. So that was one of the jewels on my crown was to work on the second Transformers film, I think is the one I was most proud of because I envisioned myself wanting to work on the next film. Mm -hmm. And it so happened to end up working on that next film. So that was like a, a huge achievement for me. Like you couldn't tell me anything <laughs> at that time. I'm like, I did it. Like I made it. I got to, to, to work on it. Um, and yeah, I worked on uh, a, few, a couple of films there um, before I ended up going into feature animation at DreamWorks. And that was around... Well, I got the contract in 2009, but technically didn't start working for them until January of 2010, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I was there for about, well, five years or so, um, and worked on many films there as well. Um, but yeah. Shrek, How to Train Your Dragon. Uh, well, Shrek was like <laughs> one of the Shrek features, but yeah, How to Train Your Dragons. Um, Turbo, I believe, uh, uh, Puss in Boots. Um, there was, oh, there was one that didn't get released that I worked on, you know, so. You also worked in that, I, I still need to, to watch that movie. You also worked in that movie, um, there's like cars, and then you have like boobs that look like, um, look like a movie that came out of Hot Wheels. I, it's called, it's oh no, that was, that was that was Turbo. I think that was Turbo. Yeah, that's Turbo. No, no, no. I, I, it was like a movie, not an animation. Oh, movie. you mean Speed Racer? Yeah, Speed Racer. Yeah, that was at Digital Dom Domain. Yes, that I have film. that. I have that movie in my list to watch for a while now because, like, a friend of mine, he was like, "That movie is amazing." Like, I never watched it. That's so cool, and I never actually watched the movie. I think Speed Racer was underrated. But I think also there are some things they, like that film, especially because at the time, 3D was like the new thing in terms of like going to the movie theaters and putting on the glasses and mm -hmm. watching 3D. That was the perfect film to do that, you know, that not, not the gimmick, but the gimmick of 3D with because it was, an, it was like a, a, you know, a nonstop ride in essence. And I love working on that film only because I got paid a lot of money working in that film. You know, it was my first time, I think, in my career where I was, I think I was making $13,000 a month or something crazy like that at the time because of all the overtime and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. it was, you know, like I had never seen a paycheck that big in my life, whatever, um, for just working something. So, um, but what was also cool about that film is that um, you, for the most part, uh, at least as a texture artist, um, we got to own entire vehicles and mm -hmm. like a sequence or a shot. So you you knew your car whenever you saw it on film or whatever, because you spent so many hours painting these, these things, whatever. Um, and then towards the end, we needed help with finishing the film. We also got involved with um, assembling sequences um, and uh, and, and helping out with lighting as well. So I did some lighting for a few shots too. That was my first time doing lighting in the production environment as well as on, on the film. Um, 
I think it was Kim LeBerry and Molly over their VFX supervisors. I think that was like, that was that was um, a lot of things. a lot of a lot of overtime on that show. <laughs> yeah, from from like all of the projects that you worked like throughout your career in entertainment, which one was your favorite one to work at? Project wise, yeah. In, in terms of like the actual like you know the the, the show or like the studio. Um, the one that you had like the most fun. Working is never fun. Like it's, it's always stressful, especially when you when you have like a deadline for a movie. But the one that you're like, oh, this, this is actually like a an interesting project to work on, and I'm having fun on this one. Um, most fun. That's hard to quantify. I I, I want to say transformed only because of the aforementioned. But now that I think about it. Um, that's tough to say. I don't know what the fun to work on. That's tough. I don't know. I I want to say one of those two films, basically, only because either Transformers because of it being one on my vision to do or to work at, but. Speed race because I make so much money on that film. <laughs> so, um, I don't know, it's tough. I would say the most rewarding probably was How to Train Your Dragons 2 um, because I was working with amazing artists, like people I didn't think I deserved to work with because they were so good. And, and they, um, I'm not gonna say any names, but like, <laughs> Across the board, the surfacers on that show, I I see them, uh, like just and now they even even more sick and, and incredible. Um, and I just remember being, so I remember uh, at the time I didn't I didn't know I don't know how the process even worked or how that happened, but I remember that I was a part of the group that was uh, nominated for a visual effects award by the VFX mm -hmm. Society. For the work we had done on *How to Train Your Dragons 2*, and I think we we're competing at the time against *Big Hero 6* and um, some other animations at the time that came out at the same time. And I just remember feeling like I did not deserve to be even recognized along in this group at all because I like I didn't do anything, like I didn't do anything special, or whatever. So <laughs> there's people that were much smarter than me, much more talented than me, who also worked in the film that I thought were more deserving of recognition than me. So I think being able to be a part of a group like that um and having a, the supervisor at the time i think i had a, 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 yeah it was just yeah if you if you were in the team it's because you deserve to be there that's just what i have to say not give it enough credit but no, but I'm I'm being genuine. I'm being <laughs> like genuine. Like I honestly, God, it was a it was a it was it was a wonderful experience. I thank God I got to experience that whole industry side of the awards, like recognition and being at the the awards dinner, and you know, you know, like what you see on TV and mm -hmm. stuff, like what else, and and seeing how that thing works, that whole process works. You know, it's very illuminating and eye opening. But at the same time, I just felt like I didn't. I like I, I was not I was a nobody, but I was like I'm not like I'm not like there's other people that were more deserving <laughs> that I than this crazy silly person me. So um, but I found out recently that they were nominated. Um, I think Puss in Boots. I think. Uh, did you, Did you watch the new one? I have not seen the new one yet. It's good. I worked on the first it's one. Really I was good. Part of that team. I remember working on that one. But I was not a part of the second one at all. But uh, from what I've seen of like the trailers and things, it looks really beautiful. It's good. And I know it's going to, in terms of like whatever work they did, it's probably going to be out of this world amazing in terms yeah. of, of, of visual effects and stuff. So I'm not concerned about that. It's going to be great to see my former colleagues work on the screen. You know, it's um, but it's one of those movies that um, I was going to a very low expectation the movie but at the end of it I was like it's been a while since I've seen animation that good and a story 
that good as well. Um, it is a very entertaining and very well, it's a very good movie. Um, it's funny because my, my brother watched the movie first and then he was bothering me that I had to go watch a film. I was like, okay, let's go. And I was like, at the end, it's funny because I watched Avatar 2 and mm -hmm. then Pussy Boots in the same week. And I was like, I prefer Pussy Boots like a hundred times over Avatar 2. Wow. So, yeah. Um, well, it's really awesome. good. It's very entertaining. It is a very entertaining uh, movie. Um, Okay, so the, during like DreamWorks, you also work on Kung Fu Panda. That was just uh, many. I believe it was many. I don't think I did any work on Kung Fu Panda. Like, if I did anything, it wasn't nothing to be credited for. It was like just helping with something on the side or whatever, but nothing meaningful. I, I still need to try to get many to do like one of these as well um, because it's. I remember like when when we were doing like the tour at DreamWorks, one thing that I didn't know, I think that like most people don't really know that. Uh, many was describing the effect that Kung Fu Panda had in the Chinese market because of the way that they yes. honor the culture. And that is something that I had no idea. And I think that like most people don't even think about those things on um, like how DreamWorks like, try to actually honor like their ideals and bring that part of the story to Kung Fu right. Panda, which is very important for, for animations and how you do things, like when you care about the culture, uh, it's very important how that translates to, to what you do. Very true, no, and I think that's to their credit that they were visionary and looking at, you know, their influence in the space and in the world and trying to be sensitive to the cultures that they or in some cases, borrowing their, you know, um, stories from or, mm -hmm. or basing their stories on in some aspects. So DreamWorks, I think, you know, has done a pretty good job of being conscious of, 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 of what they're doing in that regard. So I, I can't talk negatively about them in that sense. So. Um, one thing um, that, ties into that as well. On Meta Studios, one of the most, one of the decisions that when it comes to fairness in the company and making sure that uh, we create things in a fair way that is inclusive to everyone, that um, we build things with a purpose. Um, I would say that 95% comes from you. Um, why is that something that is super important for you, for us to build something that gives people um, an opportunity not only to be like part in the studio, uh, but also basically absorb other people's ideas and build things that um, that have meaning in the world, and and we can basically help people um, and just basically have a path on a company that is more um, more pro human than just basically building a corporation? I love that question. It gives me to ramble even more, but I'll, I'll, I'll try not to. Um, I think fundamentally it boils down to the fact that um, all of us just want to have a fair opportunity to live the best life that we can. We don't have the luxury of choosing what family we're born into, what society or country we're born in, or what resources we have access to. We come into this world with, in many cases, restrictions and limitations that are imposed on us by systems and individuals that we do not know and can probably never know or even have any real control over necessarily. But in situations where we can exert control or we can you know, um, help shape the environment or the experience, I think we should. And for me, whether it be a company, the game, um, or just my personal human interactions, at the end of the day, it's about people. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think 
when you treat people, and you were talking about this before the call, uh, the way you want to be treated and to have them front of mind and center in terms of the vision, I think they, along with you, will help create that better space, that better world. So for me, I wanna see a reflection of my values in the things I'm involved with to the utmost degree that I can or as possible. I understand that I don't live in this idealized reality, it doesn't exist yet or maybe never exist, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try to aim for it, right? So I take that quite personally because Again, growing up and experience what I experienced in my life and seeing the hardship and struggles of my mom as a single mother who had her husband taken from her through gun violence, growing up poor and having to overcome all that stuff, and yet not letting it define who I am. It informed who I am. It doesn't define me. Um, I think I have more compassion and empathy for individuals' experiences and struggles um, to whatever degree it is. And if we can just help make that experience better and have them involved with the process, I think we all will be rewarded by what we bring to the table. So for me, making the game or the studio or whatever equitable, it's just, it just to me, it's, it's not the, not, it's not about being the right thing. It's just a logical thing to do. It's just it's, it's just makes sense. Like why not? Like like because the world is what it is doesn't mean that it should be that way, right? Just because things have been done a certain way for hundreds of years doesn't mean it sh it's right or it should continue that way. If we, as a society and as a species, have evolved and grown and matured in some degrees to the point to now where there's Overall, to be argued, it's contentious potentially, but by and large, it's pretty obvious that people are living longer, healthier, more rewarding lives than they did just 100, 200, 1,000 years ago. The world seems to be a lot more fair. It's because we've acquired tools to help us navigate the unknown and navigate our place in this vast ocean of time and space, not to get too philosophical. So for me, it's about making sure that I help others experience the best quality experience in their life that they can, especially if they're involved with anything that I'm a part of in that sense. So, yeah. yeah. Now, like, I, I think that that, like, reflects, like, every single time that we, that we chat about, like, I'm, I'm going to call it company design, <laughs> like on how we, we plan on building things and just overall on, on our outlook, even in terms of um, of tools that you want to build and enabling people to uh, be able to express their creativity. Um, there is a place that is really comes from, from passion and making, enabling people to be able to create and to co-create with us. And if we can help them, um, then I don't see why not. Like I often, I often say that, and people like whenever I'm, I'm talking about, for example, the studio, or just like in general in in uh, in interviews and so on, I often say that um, that in our studio, I'm like surrounded with such amazing people and so talented. Like everyone is like super talented. And then there's me. It's like it's just surrounded no. like the most amazing people. <laughs> and then there's me. And I feel like one of those things is that I feel super lucky because throughout my entire career, whenever I reflect um, in my career, I was basically one. I'm lucky basically to have you and many as friends, but also as mentors that basically allowed me to have a better guided career that I'll be to be in position that I am to yet today. Um, and it is one of those things that is not just like for for PR or anything, um, even for in CGMA level outside of Meta Studio. But we do things because we really care and uh, and just trying to enable people to be 
better people as we we build a business because I, again like i'm in a position that a lot of people don't have the ability to be in position that i am so i see that it just makes sense to to pass that forward to more people as well yeah but i mean not humble bragging necessary but carlos like you are amazing so um i'm not gonna go into great detail but like you are probably one of if not the hardest working person I know next to Manny, uh, period. So I think, you, anyway, I won't go to that. Let's just say you are more than qualified to be amongst the people you are associated. So that's all I want to say to you. I think like the thing is, it's so funny because um, whenever I talk with, um, I won't say names, but the other day I had a conversation with someone that you know as well. The other person said, you are so young. I wish I was your age. And for me, instead of taking that as a compliment, in the back of my mind, I was like with an imposter syndrome. I was like, should I be here having this conversation in the first place? Uh, I think it's the same thing that you're mentioning for, um, for the DreamWorks uh, in How to Train Your Dragon. I feel that like there is always a part of us that it doesn't matter like if people perceive us as being good at something. Uh, there's always the part that again because I'm surrounded with such amazing people, I always have like that um, that um, that dog that is like, am I like? Yeah, no, that's a fair <laughs> point. That's a fair point. I, I literally thought that that very exact uh, concept, imposter syndrome, went through my head as I was describing that, but like. That exists, and I think that, you know, in small doses, mm -hmm. it's, it's okay. It's just when it becomes all-consuming that it becomes an issue. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, individuals should be careful of that only because, you know, the inverse of that, you know, is arrogance and mm -hmm. whatever, like conceited or self-centered. I think, as cliche as it sounds, you need to find a balance somewhere in the middle. It's like... In the same breath that I can tell you about that experience and, and how it made me feel or how I experienced it, I can also confidently tell you that I know that if all of this was stripped away from me and I was left poor without any money, I would be okay because mm -hmm. I've already lived it. I've been homeless three times in my life, pursuing different endeavors and ventures, pursuing art in this career. You know, I've had to overcome, you know, violence and all that other stuff from my childhood and stuff growing up. Um, so adversity is not an alien to me. It's a very common foe, but it is common nonetheless. So I know that I can take it because I took it already, mm -hmm. right? So I'm confident in that if god forbid i was to be forced to start all over again nothing changed this mind this mind yeah. that's here is still the same mind that got me to where i am right now so as long as i'm in my right mind mm -hmm. that's the caveat and i still have the use of my body and limbs i will be okay i will find a way so that i can speak boldly and confidently because i've already done it many times so in that sense you know, I don't have any doubts about that. And I think that tenacity comes from overcoming hardship, that you can't get any other way. Like you can't be taught that. You have to live that, I think, unfortunately, in many cases. So for me, it's like, uh, to borrow a lyric from one of my, uh, Mumu Fresh, she has uh, one of her songs. To paraphrase her, basically, because of what she able, able to overcome, she can walk, she, whenever she walks by a mirror, she has to stop and admire herself because mm -hmm. she's like, you know, I did it. I, mm -hmm. I, I am somebody in that sense. So that I still, I, 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 that I have, you know, but I think it's a balance, like, because if you go too far in any extreme, it's either like becoming depressed and self-loathing and all the other negatives in that direction to the conceited, arrogant, you know, self-righteous and, you know, so I don't want to be any of those extremes. I want to be centered, you know, in my own truth 
that's based on my own experience you know so yeah yeah no i agree i think that like that um that a lot of people they basically go to life and and i, I think that that is that is something that is common for most people to think about that when they get to say, a certain point they think that am i like good enough to be here but i don't see the people also take the time to give themselves enough credit um yeah true but at the same time at the same time like our team is is so amazing that i'm like okay like even for example Volney and rodrigo they are like incredible amazing. at what they do um rodrigo on his own he's like a he's like a a celebrity in in the digital art in brazil and and the other day I was talking with, a, with a, an artist um, and he was like, and I was telling him like, um, Rodrigo basically works with us, like they worked with Mera Studio. He was like, wait, you know Rodrigo? And I was like, yeah, he, he <laughs> works with us, like it, it's Rodrigo. And then that's when I realized like the impact that even Rodrigo, for example, has like in other people's life on how they basically have him as an inspiration. And when I was telling him that, he was like, really? It was like, yeah, like it's so fun because it's one of those things that he's so good at what he does. And he, uh, like, he's like so focused in mastering his craft that he doesn't even think about the impact that he has on other people's lives as well in terms of being an inspiration for, for other artists, which is very interesting to look at from the outside perspective of things. Yeah, no, I, I yes. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, and actually, I think it's maybe the plight of the artist to always have that duality of experience mm -hmm. in terms of not recognizing when they are more than good enough versus, or not versus, but in contrast to feeling inadequate or not enough when comparing yeah. themselves to others, right? And for me, that manifested in my life a lot of especially in in, um, in in college. And I think of another, another life lesson is that I forgot who informed me of it, but I remember holding on to it all these years is that, and I tell it to other uh, students, whenever I speak to students um, starting out their careers, you're not competing against the person in your classroom or the person you grew up with. You're competing against me, mm -hmm. right? So as long as you remember that when you're aiming for a career or a job, that can sound very overwhelming or like insurmountable, like you're competing against other professionals who already mm -hmm. are doing it. But that's what you should be aiming for in the first place if you yeah. want to you know, work at that level, right? So it's not about being better than anyone that you know, it's about aspiring to be as good as the people you look up to, because yes. that's what you're going to replace ultimately as you mm -hmm. come along behind them. It's, I mean, in, in my case, there's a lot of different variables of things that need to be taken into account as to how and why I am where I am right now. But the biggest component is I went through the training to take advantage of the opportunity when it arose. Had I not studied art, had I not gone to school for computer animation, when that time came for me to do work in the industry, I wouldn't have been ready, you know, yeah. when it was available. So it's making sure that um, you're prepared for when it happens, basically. Because you never know when it can happen or mm -hmm. what vector or, 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 or direction it's going to come from, you know. Um, and yeah, it's just it's just making sure that you're doing what you know to do in terms of the best that you can do, um, and don't beat yourself up if you don't achieve your goal. Because again, as long as you have breath in your body, you're in your right mind, and you can, you know, use your body to to to, to do this, the work that you do. You you have a way. There's yeah. always a way out. You know, or way forward is what I should say. Um, so that's what I would say. Yeah. And, and there's one thing that I also learned um, then throughout my career that usually people don't use that enough. That is, whenever you're having um, 
a problem, that you know that there is someone else that already solved that problem, most right. often, if you reach out to that person and you just ask, 99% of, like 99%, the person will reply back to you and help you solve that problem. I see it just people, like, you know, a lot of times people are just afraid to ask for someone, especially when it's like in professional sense, where people like, everyone is so busy. But I think that people would find very interesting on how often people actually stop to reply to an email to help you out in the problem that you have. So, right. yeah, I think that that is something, it's another, like, another life hack that a lot of people don't really use it. Um, I believe that it's like a lot of people are just afraid of the rejection of getting a no from someone. But um, in my career, every single time that I reach out to someone, to sit down for like a 50 minute conversation just basically to pick their brain. Uh, I actually, now that I think about it, I never had someone say, no, I can't do that. Um, which is, and even for people that like, in, I remember that when I was uh, running the Blackbird, I reached out to Reed and Reed at the time was, um, was working, I believe as the CMO or, like in a director position at masterclass uh, for marketing. And I reached out to him like via LinkedIn. And like he has like, this amazing career. And I was like, oh, let me, let me just like try because I wanted to pick his brain. And literally like two hours later, we we're sitting down and having a conversation about whatever I wanted to ask him about marketing and growth and, and what was going on in terms of how they approach things at masterclass and so on. So it's funny because again, just like, reach out to the person you're like oh yeah, it's fine let's, let's let's chat and i see that like a lot of, of times people are just afraid of also asking um for people that are already done what they want to do for their insights and and help right no it's true yeah yeah so and the only caveat i would give to that is and for me in particular because i'm so random sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> if you email me and i don't get back to you it's not personal <laughs> There's at least six different ways you can reach out to me if that's the case. But um, yeah. yeah, so, but no, I, it's true. Like once you got my attention in terms of like, I see the email, mm -hmm. oh my God, like I will, well, you know, me, probably, yeah. so, uh, I will go above and beyond in terms of giving my time to help someone with whatever answers they need in terms of certain questions, whatever. So that is not a, but to me, that's, that's like a given, like, yeah. yeah, so. Okay, so my last question, because I know that you also have to go, uh, is if you will basically choose one historical figure to sit down for a coffee, going in the same theme of asking questions, uh, who will that person be? Wow. Oh, let, let's actually remove like the historical figure, figure. If it could be like anyone in the world, regardless of being an historical person or not. That's tough. There's so many. I'm thinking in terms of, so the, the journey I'm on, I've been on as of late, um, and I haven't really acted on it in any meaningful way. And that's because of a number of things um but i would love to know more about my heritage mm -hmm. my the background from where my family came from being and and i i don't even know what term is the, the correct one to use these days but i grew up being you know referring to myself as black or african-american right mm -hmm. so or or in, as they are commonly are more, or not accurately, but like being referred to today as um, African American or Black Americans that are descendant from slaves. Right? Mm -hmm. So I know that I've made, through the help of many people, through God, through whatever you want to ascribe, I have a pretty okay life, pretty decent life. I'm, I'm doing okay, right? 
Um, so my sense of self-identity is not shaken in that sense. But in terms of a cultural identity or a familial identity, in terms of like just where my family came from, like I see myself asking questions that I don't have easy answers for. Mm -hmm. And I'm also reflecting on times in my life as a young person when I was struggling with certain things and how it relates to that, that lack of identity, right? Um, so I would want to talk to one of my, I guess, ancestors or something to understand not necessarily the world they lived in or grew up in, but more so the world that they came from, if that makes any sense. Like, mm -hmm. I can't trace my ancestors back past a certain point. Like, it just stops. Like, there's just a, a wall of like unknowableness or ignorance, what do you want to call it? And for me, I feel like there's a, a hole in, in part of me in terms of not having an identity. So I think uh, I want to discover that part of my experience that I'm a beneficiary of but have no idea about, mm -hmm. you know? So the person I want to speak to would be whichever ancestor is the most knowledgeable about all of that stuff. <laughs> I would love to do that. Another person would be my father because I was three years old when he was killed and I have like two or three memories of him from that time. And they're very fond memories, but they're very limited. And especially as time goes on, they become less clear mm -hmm. and bitter. So I would love to understand him as a man and what he thought about life and everything and not just third party accounts of, of mm -hmm. his experience. And then in terms of famous people, wow. Um, I would say, It would be a tie between Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, Richard Feynman, um, I would say, I would say Toni Morrison, uh, and maybe Martin Luther King. <laughs> Those would be the people. I don't have a, I can think of name many other people, but of them, it'd be really hard to choose one. So I would say, yeah. You can create like a time traveling machine and then go like in a coffee shop and put them all together and have a very interesting conversation. Oh, it would be very interesting. <laughs> yeah. I think it will be a very, very interesting conversation. Um, what, one, peop, one, one of, um, I often, like with these questions, uh, I have like one go-to person that I would like to sit down in terms of historical person. Um, but now that I think of, actually there is another person in my list that I find very interesting, um, that it will be Nelson Mandela. Like, huh? to go and sit down with him for, for a shot because um, what he did, it's not easy. And I think that in terms of, um, of as we go through life, I believe that it's extremely important to have a purpose. Um, and he is one of the people that I see reflection of his purpose and, com and completing his purpose, or at least from the outside perspective, thinking like we observe, observe it as he completed his purpose, which I, I would like to ask him if that is the same way that he feels that he actually completed Probably his not, purpose. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And yeah, that's very much it. I thank you very much for, for joining me today, Ted. 
I well, think thank that. Thank you for inviting me, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> no worry. I wanted to give people a little bit of the wonderful TED uh, friend, mentor, and also co founder of Meta Studio, so people can get to know you a little bit more. Um, and yeah, um, one of the most influential people in my life. So, wow. <laughs> well, I must be very careful with that. I must... <laughs> yeah, so, thank you. <laughs> um but yeah i think it was it was a very fun conversation and i think that um that because of me you'll get people sending you emails asking you life questions as well so yes. <laughs> just be patient with me don't take it personal but take a long time to reply but i will get back to people awesome thank you very much ted and thank you. I appreciate i'm it. looking forward to have another one like this in the future and I'm going to try to drag down many into one of these conversations as well. Right. No, that'd be great. Again, thank you for your time. Thank everyone for you know giving us your time and attention. And hopefully, you, you know, you give us a shot and we can grow and shape and create something really, really wonderful. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.